Hello everyone and welcome back to Towergate. It is day 154, August the 6th, 2017, Sunday. Well, hopefully you guys have had a good weekend and uh, we still got some time left before it's over. So hopefully you're uh, having a good Sunday and we'll enjoy your Sunday evening. But um, let's go ahead and get to the topics of the day because there are many things here to cover, many important issues which have popped up in the last 24 hours. So let's get right to them. Big League Politics efforts are now underway by neoconservative operative Bill Kristol to start a committee not to, re not to renominate the president in 2020. The establishment conservatives, like Ben Sass, are already planning to lay the groundwork for challenges to Trump in 2020. John Kasich and Tom Cotton are also showing signs of a 2020 primary challenge to Trump. While at the same time, we have Senator John Magoo, who's leading a not-so-silent coup effort to impeach the president and to replace him with Mike Pence. And of course, we have Uncle Bob and his posse trying to execute the political assassination of the president. Well, this shouldn't surprise any of us. Uh, Bill Kristol's been a never-Trumper from the beginning. He is, of course, the neocons, neocon, and, uh, of course, uh, he is all cuddled up with the Hillary Clinton operatives as well. Uh, I'm pretty sure he was um, uh, a supporter of Hillary Clinton against Donald Trump. It doesn't surprise me that we have all these Republicans out there thinking about a challenge in 2020. None of that should surprise any of us because they are part of the deep state coup. And the plan, of course is to every single day attack Trump from every direction, left and right, center, any direction they can get him from, to weaken him more and more and more, to prevent him from being able to move forward with his domestic or foreign policy agenda, and then after se severely weakening him, uh, if they can't get him out of office with impeachment, then they can, after stagnating his entire first four years, they can say he's a failed president, and primary him, run against him, challenge him in 2020. This is the plan of the neoconservatives led by the neoconservatives, neoconservative, the operative Bill Kristol. Of course, Bill Kristol failed in his efforts during the election to stop Trump, and I believe he will fail in his, in his efforts to... I certainly expect they will challenge Trump in 2020, but I just don't think they'll defeat him as long as... Everybody else takes care of their business. And everybody else, I mean Trump supporters. Let's not forget that Trump took on a field of 17 Republicans, which the Republican establishment told us was the best field they had seen in years and years and years. Donald Trump defeated them all pretty handily. It was really Donald Trump versus anti-Trump. And every time Trump knocked off somebody, people went to the next guy in line, the anti-Trumpers. And he went through the entire field of them, finally getting down to Ted Cruz. And he finally defeated him when the race, uh, when the primary came down to the Indiana primary and Trump won and sealed that deal. I expect the uh, similar thing will happen in 2020. Uh, Trump supporters just need to stay uh, motivated and they need to keep supporting him. And the establishment will find basically the same results they got in 2016. They will lose because nobody likes them. I'll have more to say about that in tomorrow's video. Also, Big League Politics, and I'm going to provide a link for you on this particular story, is saying that an anonymous source who has provided Big League Politics with notes taken from a meeting between Rod Wheeler and police detective Joseph Della Camera that took place on April 25th, 2017 in Wheeler's Maryland office. Della Camera states that the interview states in the interview that the Metro Police Department gave him strict rules not to talk about the Seth Rich case because of what the case is. Detective Della Camera uh, also says that he will is afraid that he'll be reassigned if he talks about or makes any waves regarding the Seth Rich case. So I'm going to provide a link to you for this um, um, 
story. It's not so much a story as much as it is the leaked email conversation uh, uh, or the leaked conversation. It wasn't an email. It was actually a face-to-face -face meeting at Wheeler's office in Maryland. But Wheeler, what he did was he took notes. And after the meeting, uh, of course, sometime after the meeting, these notes found their way uh, into the leak system through the plumbing system, and they showed up, and uh, they found their way onto big league politics by someone. I assume Rob Wheeler himself, but it uh, could be anybody. But basically, it's a pretty interesting little uh, thing to read, and it's essentially uh, uh, this detective who's, who's the assigned to the Seth Rich case, Detective Della Camera talking with Rob Wheeler and Rob Wheeler talking to him about various things, the main focus being on the uh, possible uh, link between uh, Seth Rich's murder and his work at the DNC, which of course Mr. Della Camera uh, doesn't put a lot of stock in. So just a couple of finer points of things that they discussed and what Della Camera said to some of the questions Wheeler asked him are the following. When Wheeler asked Della Camera about the information that's on Seth Rich's computer, Della Camera said he could not talk about what was on Rich's computer. Now, uh, it's been alleged that the FBI uh, got a hold of Seth Rich's computer, but it's also being said that no, it's still with the Metro PD. There's also some people saying that no, it was given back to the Riches. So, uh, no one really seems to know where that laptop computer of Seth Rich is, but it certainly does need to be looked at. It's strange that Mr. Della Camera doesn't have more information. Obviously, he's not wanting to talk about what they learned, but I suspect that they didn't learn very much because if they did, uh, or if they did learn something, they're not allowed to talk about it because we're not getting the information. So he was not able, Wheeler was not able to get much out of Della Camera about the info that may be on Rich's computer. Um, Wheeler also asked him about the uh, surveillance cameras and Della Camera basically says that well we've exhausted all the footage from the video cameras and the only thing that pr provided us anything <clears throat> was one video that showed the legs of two people. It showed them entering the scene and ex ex exiting the scene and it shows a little bit of Seth Rich apparently after being shot uh, falling over backwards. And that's really the only thing he says that they learned from the surveillance cameras. Now, I guess what's strange to me about this is that we learned here a couple of months ago from the manager at Lou's City Bar who knew Seth Rich pretty well because he came in there all the time. It was his regular watering hole. Um, he states that the police detectives never came into Lou's City Bar and questioned him or any of the people there who knew Seth pretty well. We haven't learned very much about whether or not they questioned any of the his associates, his fellow employees at the DNC. We haven't heard much information about whether or not they questioned or had anything uh, that they may have had a conversation with any of Seth Rich's roommates. He lived with two or three other people in a house. So we don't really hear about any of these people being questioned or anything that they might have had to say. And uh, there's not much discussed about that in this conversation, but again, you get the feeling when you look at this conversation and the lack of information we have from other potential witnesses or sources, it just doesn't look like they tried very hard to get the information. It looks like there was a cover up uh, in this particular murder from minute one after it happened, and probably even before. Della Camera also says he doesn't know if the FBI is involved. Well, how would that be possible? How could you be the, the uh, detective assigned to the case and not know whether or not the FBI was involved? Well, we now know that the FBI was involved because we now have at least ways two good sources, including one being Seymour Hirsch, stating that he knows for a fact that the FBI has a file on Seth Rich and that they in fact did go through his computer and that they did find where he sent information to WikiLeaks. The fact that the police detective uh, for the Metro PD is either lying 
or being kept out of the loop certainly uh, gives us more reason to question what is going on here and it only feeds more fuel to the fire and the idea that there is a cover-up going on. And Mr. Della Camera is simply trying to protect himself and his career. Mr. Della Camera also says he does not think it was a professional hit because it was not a head shot. This, of course, goes to my point, and I have some agreement here with uh, the detective. I, too, believe that, again, uh, Roger Stone and some others are suggesting it was a uh, Brennan CIA hit. Uh, again, if it was a Brennan CIA hit, uh, the way things typically would work there is it would have been a foreign assassin who would have been brought in and it probably would have been a uh, one of the Corsican hitmen who are contracted through Sicily. Whether or not Seth Warren, Seth Rich's uh, murder would have warranted that type of heavy play through the CIA, I'm not sure. Possibly, uh, knowing Brennan's connection to the Clintons and to the overall deep state program, it's very possible <clears throat> that the hit could have been run out of the CIA. And if it was, it was likely performed by a foreign professional. But the fact of the matter is, foreign professionals or professionals of anywhere on the planet who are in that business, they generally don't leave the guy laying there alive and conscious, awake, and able to communicate. If this would have been a professional, you can bet that Seth Rich would have taken, it doesn't necessarily have to be a headshot, but certainly professional assassins know how to kill people very, very quickly, instantly. And uh, they wouldn't have left <clears throat> Seth Rich laying on the ground, able to talk and live for several more hours and not die in the hospital, where he could possibly give up information and probably did. So I, too, agree kind of with the detective. I don't think this was a pro hit. That doesn't mean I don't believe it wasn't a political hit. I do. But I believe it was probably carried out at the local level, not by the CIA, but probably done through people connected to the DNC. And the people who generally do the thuggery for the DNC is these uh, SEIU thugs that you typically see uh, who typically engage in low-level type uh, uh, activities such as throwing a brick through your window, making threatening phone calls, slicing your tires, uh, egging your car, uh, following you. These are the types of things that you typically see them do, intimidating people at voting places on voting day. Um, uh, taking actions against <clears throat> people who are uh, pushing to uh, uh, get rid of a union or something like that. This is typically where you see the SEIU thugs come into play. You gen generally don't think of, about them as being used as you know professionals. But there's also connections between organized crime and these labor unions. So who knows in the shady cloak and dagger world that these people exist in, where that came from, and I don't even know that that's the most important question that we need to be focused on now. It's certainly where you would want to end up, but the question right now is, in fact, was it a, a was the murder of Seth Rich, first two things, was Seth Rich a DNC leaker? I'm about 98% sure he was, and if that's the case, was his murder connected to the fact that he was the leaker? And I believe that there is a, a uh, at least enough reason for all the other things that we have regarding Seth Rich to suggest that that is an area that should be investigated and it doesn't appear that that is what has happened. It appears that since the very beginning of this, uh, since Seth Rich was murdered, there has never been any type of an effort, as far as I know, by the FBI or by the Metro Police to take a look at the possibility and start investigating into the possibility that Seth Rich's murder was connected to his uh, job at the DNC and the possibility that he was the one who leaked the documents, the emails, to WikiLeaks. It just doesn't seem that they want to go down this road. And, of course, it doesn't help that we have the assistant district attorney, happens to be the brother of Debbie Wasserman, Blabbermouth, Schultz. So these are some conflicts of interest and some issues that still uh, are the reason why myself and many other people question exactly the integrity of the investigation um, or even the appearance.
appearance of, integ of integrity of an investigation. I mean, there's not even the appearance that this is a real investigation that has any interest in getting to the truth. Mr. Wheeler also asked <clears throat> uh, Mr. Della Camera about the three officers who had body cameras and the fact that Seth Rich was alive and able to communicate when they arrived on scene. And of course, uh, Mr. Della Camera says that he cannot talk about what may have been learned from the police officers who arrived on scene first with the body cameras. We're not allowed to see the body cameras. We're not allowed to hear about what may have happened. We're giving absolutely zero amount of information about anything that Seth Rich may have been asked or what he may have said. Anybody who knows anything about police, law enforcement, training, or anything else knows that when you arrive on the scene of a fresh murder and the uh, uh, or, or gunshot victim or victim of some sort of a violent crime, the very first thing that the cops are trained to do is to try to find out if the, if the person um, who's been assaulted or assailed, if that person is able to communicate, <clears throat> if they have any idea who attacked them. That's the first question you're going to ask. Do you know who did this? <clears throat> Can you identify your attacker? Who was your attacker? These are the questions that you're going to ask. We have to assume these questions were asked. We have to assume there is video cam footage from those three officers who had body cams, and that would shine a lot of light onto uh, this particular murder and answer a lot of questions. But again, Mr. Della Camera is saying that he cannot talk about what the officers may have learned or what may, may be on those body cams. Wheeler also asked Mr. Della Camera <clears throat> with the investigation of what was there an investigation into Seth Rich's finances? Did they know that if he had ever received any money from WikiLeaks or anyone else? And of course, Della Camera says that they really didn't look that much into his financial situation, but maybe they'll consider looking into that now. <laughs> this is unbelievable. Certainly, you would want to look into that. Uh, again, but that's another angle that you would look at if he may have been connected to the DNC and was a leaker or something like that, because obviously if he's leaking documents, he may be compensated for that in some way. Um, so you would think that they would certainly have already looked into that. So what you learn, again, from this, this uh, conversation of Mr. Wheeler's notes, which I, I will provide the link for you, it just, again... Uh, reinforces what many of us already believe, which is that there's never been any type of a serious investigation into the Seth Rich murder, that it's been a cover-up from day one and probably even before that, and it doesn't appear that even in the course of their investigation, the most basic things that you would do were not done or else they're not telling us about it. And of course, they completely, from day one, have never ever been interested and, and investigating towards the idea that Seth Rich's murder may have been connected to him, either A, being the source of the WikiLeaks, or B, having something to do with his work there at the DNC. Mr. Wheeler also did ask uh, Mr. Della Camera if he knew about the fact that Seth Rich was having problems with two of his superiors there at the DNC. We know that he was. We know that that was something that Seth Rich had talked about. And we know one of those people is Donna Brazil. So we know that Seth Rich was clearly having some issues with two of his superiors at the DNC. But it doesn't appear that Mr. Della Camera, even though he says he's aware of the fact that Seth Rich was having some issues with two of his superiors at the DNC, he said that's not an angle that they've looked into. That should not surprise us. <clears throat> The American Center for Law and Justice has received a DOJ document dump that they requested. Unfortunately, most of it is redacted. Now keep in mind, this is the Trump administration. This is Jeff Sessions' uh, you know, uh, Department of Justice uh, who would have uh, come forth with these documents and would have redacted them, blacked them out. Now, I don't no, obviously Donald Trump doesn't personally sit there and redact things, and probably Sessions does not either. I would assume that these are lawyers that work at the DOJ. Maybe Sessions is not aware that um, that uh, 
there was so much redaction of these documents. And I'm sure Trump was not aware of it either. Obviously, he is now because this has become very, very public. It's being talked about on several different media networks, most prominently Fox. And uh, so they are talking about what they received. And uh, basically, despite the redactions that are present, the email conversations, what is revealed in this information is that the email conversations, there were email conversations between the Department of Justice, the FBI, and media officials. It reveals 100% proof that Comey lied because Comey said that there were no documents regarding the, uh, the meeting on the plane between Lynch and Comey, or between Lynch and uh, Slick Willie. But now they've received 460 pages of documents. So Comey said there were no documents, but we now know that the uh, Center for Law and Justice has just received 460 pages, mostly redacted. It shows that the DOJ colluded with the media to ignore or spin the story of the meeting on the tarmac. Clearly an illegal an illegality. So the evidence proves from just what we can see that Loretta Lynch and James Comey and every major news outlet besides Fox conspired to spin the tarmac meeting where Lynch met with a slick willy concerning Hillary Clinton's email scandal. So just more evidence uh, that's just piling up there like a mountain of the collusion between not just the Department of Justice and the FBI coordinating together to cover up that story. We know from the day that it happened that the FBI uh, would not allow any reporters or anyone to take photographs of anything. And so there was a clampdown on that meeting from day one. I'm all, I would not be the least bit surprised. In fact, probably is true that they knew about this meeting, that this was not an accidental fact that they bumped into each other uh, at these tarmacs at this airport. This was probably a planned meeting. And they probably knew as soon as they arrived at that airport, uh, the FBI personnel that were there who were protecting, who were there to protect the Attorney General, probably knew this meeting was going to take place. And that's why they put the clamp down on it from day one. And this, these emails prove that there was conversations back and forth between the DOJ and uh, uh, James Comey and the FBI and how they were going to handle it. They talk about the uh, response of the press. So clearly someone is in contact with media organizations finding out how they're going to cover the story or if they're willing just to let it lay down. So clearly this shows more collusion, uh, factual collusion that we have. Again, more evidence uh, proving why Comey and Lynch should be immediately charged. Well, we have H.R. McMaster, the disaster. He is now being suspected of leaking internal White House politics to the acting FBI director, Andrew McCabe, who is, of course, a Clinton-Obama loyalist who's under three criminal investigations. An, er an internal war is currently going on within the White House between McMaster and Steve Bannon. Steve Bannon wants McMaster gone. So do I. And it looks like that McMaster, the disaster, is going to be shipped off to Afghanistan to oversee the war. Now, there was a statement that came out earlier this week, uh, allegedly by Trump, saying that he fully supported McMaster. But we're learning now from, and I believe this is a, a, a source from Roger Stone, an inside source that uh, Roger Stone is, is talking about, who says that the president never saw or approved that memo uh, or that statement that he fully supported McMaster. And this would make sense because it looks like they're trying to get McMaster out of town. They're going to send him over to Afghanistan to play around over there for a while. I guess they just want to get him out of there and see if some of the leaks stop. Uh, so again, the story that was reported earlier that, that Trump has full support of McMaster. I don't know if that's true. It appears now that that statement was not put together by Trump, nor has he ever even asked about it. It was just something that was put out there. Finally, Russian lawyer Natalia Veselnikaya is angry 
that she has not been called to testify to Congress. She gave a 10-minute interview with a Russian news program called Besti. Vessel Nakaya says that she sought the meeting as part of her efforts to help her Russian businessman, Denis Katsev, who was her client, to help uh, in his case to fight the allegations of money laundering. Vessel Nakaya was seeking support or help from Trump to get out her client's story. Vessel Nakaya said that the meeting had nothing to do with the 2016 election campaign or any of Trump's rivals. Vessel Nakaya is angry that she has not been invited to testify for any committee's investigation, including the pit bull, Trey Gowdy, who's now the head of that oversight committee. He's apparently not interested in talking to Vessel Nakaya, even though she's dying to talk to him regarding the Trump-Russia collusion story. Vessel Nakaya says, quote, they don't want the truth. They need an enemy, some because they want conflict with, with uh, Trump and some because they want conflict or to fuel conflict with Russia. This is the statement of Vessel Naskaya. Yes, it is very interesting. She's dying to testify. So now we learn that Uncle Bob has his posse looking into Jared Kushner, his family and their real estate and banking uh, practices and activities. They're looking into Trump's business activities going back 30 years. They're interested in looking into this Russia-Trump collusion, but they have no interest whatsoever in speaking to Vessel Naskaya, even though she's dying to talk to them. Maybe it's because she isn't going to tell them what they want to hear, which is that there was nothing going on with her representing the Russian government, no Russia-Trump collusion, nothing to do with any of that, that her association or her having that meeting, which she is the one who pushed for that meeting, was simply to uh, get her story out uh, for the client that she's being paid to represent. And that's all there was to it, which is exactly what everyone else who attended that meeting has to say. They're all in agreement. That meeting turned out to be something that it, different than what it was planned uh, to be. Or what, it, or what we were told it was supposed to be. And everyone is in agreement on that. But Uncle Bob doesn't seem to want to look, uh, listen or have anything to, to do with Vessel Naskaya. He doesn't seem to want to look into the relationship between Vessel Naskaya and GPS, or GPS and the DNC, or how about this, possible connections between GPS and the CIA and John Brennan, or GPS and the Democratic National Committee, Debbie Wasserman Schultz, or GPS and John McCain, or GPS and uh, the Hillary Clinton campaign. We, we know uh, that the uh, people who run GPS are very close to the, Hillary, to the Hillary Clinton campaign. It would not surprise me at all to find out that the big donor, the big Democratic donor, was simply one of Hillary and, and, and Bill Clinton's many front organizations uh, that give them protection. This should not surprise any of us, should it? No, Uncle Bob's not going down that road at all. Uncle Bob's got has been uh, brought in for one purpose only. He's been shown the target, that is President Trump, and they brought him in and said, there's your target, go find a crime. That is what is happening. Here's your target, go find a crime. Completely 180 degrees the opposite of what the special counsel is used for. There's supposed to be first a crime, evidence of a crime, then you appoint a special counsel. In this case, they appointed a special counsel to go find a crime. And clearly he's not interested in the uh, Russian angle because he's got a very key witness right here, Vessel Naskaya, who would love to come and talk to them. She would love to come and talk to the House Oversight Committee, the Senate Intelligence Committee. She would love to talk to Mr. Mueller and his posse, but none of them seem to have any interest. They're all going on vacation. Hmm. How about that? So there we go. I will provide the links as uh, as I told you uh, for the for two of these stories. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in to Towergate Day 154. 
August the 6th, 2017, Sunday. I'll be back with you on Monday with a little different uh, video for you than what we've been doing for the last couple weeks. We're going to talk about some solutions. We're going to talk about hope. We are going to talk about possibilities. We are going to talk about action. That's what we're going to talk about next. Alrighty. Thank you all for tuning in. You enjoy the rest of your evening. See you. Bye.